In July 2004, Laurie Hecking, a young and vibrant woman, vanished into thin air, setting off a massive search that captivated everyone. As the mystery unraveled, it revealed a web of lies, betrayal, and a shocking twist that no one saw coming. This is the story of Laurie Hecking. A tailor reminds us that sometimes the most harrowing stories are hidden behind a facade of a seemingly perfect life. Welcome to the Grim Riddles Crime Stories channel. Thank you for watching. Mark and Laurie were high school sweethearts. They loved each other, and Laurie's family often looked at the two and wondered how they had gotten so lucky. Mark was like a son to them. Laurie was an adopted child. Delma and Harold Suarez had taken her in after her parents were divorced in 1987. The family had met in Brazil, and after the adoption, they relocated to Orem in Utah. Laurie met Mark, the love of her life, when she attended Orem High School near Salt Lake City. It was like sparks through the very first time they saw each other when they went on the trip with their friends to Lake Powell in 1994. Everyone around them admired the deep connection formed between them over the 10 years they were together. They were a young couple, madly in love and excited about their future. By all accounts, Mark Hacking worshipped his wife for five years and he wasn't afraid to show it. He adored her and she adored him recalls Laurie's mother, Thelma Suarez. I couldn't have asked for a better son-in-law. Laura used to call him my big old teddy bear. Mark, 28, was outgoing and romantic, while Laurie, 27, was private and practical. But according to Laurie's only sibling, Paul Suarez, the combination worked. They were different, they say opposites attract, and that, I think, that was the situation, says Suarez. They were a young couple, madly in love and excited about their future. Mark was just about to start medical school, so they were planning to move to Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Laurie was giving up the job she loved and paused her studies to support Mark. Once he graduated, she planned to continue her studies. To top it all off, they just found out that Laurie was five weeks pregnant, so life seemed perfect for them. On July the 19th, 2004, Laurie went out for her usual morning run through Memory Grove and City Creek Canyon. She would normally go home to shower and change and then go to work, but on this day, she never returned from her run. Mark only found out something was wrong when he called Laurie at work, only to be told she hadn't arrived that morning. In a panic, he called 911 to report her missing. Mark called the Salt Lake City Police Dispatch at about 10.07 a.m. At the same time, he was reaching out to Laurie's friends to see if anyone knew where she was. He told them that he had checked the jogging route, which was about three miles long, but couldn't find her. Her car was still at the park entrance, but Laurie was nowhere to be seen. When Mark called the police again at 10.49 a.m. for help in finding his wife, they advised him that they usually wait 24 hours before responding to missing person reports. They suggested he check hospitals and the jail in the meantime. The police subsequently decided not to wait to start the search and investigations as they found the circumstances worrying and similar to another case in which 14-year-old Elizabeth Smart had gone missing just two years previously in similar circumstances. They feared that Laura had been kidnapped. Mark quite obviously was distraught and was taking it very badly. One of the neighbours said she had seen Laurie's car parked at the house at 7am that morning and it was still there when she went to work after 8am. This contradicted Mark's story. The police asked Mark about this, but he was too distraught to clarify the discrepancy. The police did an initial interview with Mark later that day just to confirm the details. Um, what I need you to do is kind of just tell me in your words what's been going on so far today. Um, my wife got up at five this morning, went running, um, and I stayed in bed. She, I woke up at eight and she hadn't awakened me when she got home and showered and, and went to work at seven, or at least I thought that's what had happened. Um, I normally, sometimes, most of the time I drive her to work and she, she wakes me up when she's ready and I take her to work, but sometimes she drives. So, and today she was driving, so, um, um, when I woke up and she was gone, I just figured she hadn't awakened me, just let me sleep. And so I got up at eight, did some things I um, played my Nintendo a bit, and we 
needed a new mattress. We decided to get one, so I went. And, we, and we'd been shopping around, looking at different places, and had found one. I mean, what time was that? Uh, I, I left my place at about nine. Um, I drove around. Most of the places were, were um, closed where I was looking, but they, uh, one place said on the door that they were, they would open at 10, but I got what there. What place was that, you know? I, I, I can't remember the name, but it's, it's right next to R.C. Willie. In a disappearance or murder, the husband or partner is always at the top of the list of suspects, so Mark was asked to take a polygraph test to rule him out. He refused, which was a bit suspicious. This is just a way reform. It's basically saying you're taking this of your own free will. Nobody's forcing you or coercing you or anything of that nature. Okay, yeah, you can agree with that. If you can agree with that, just sign that there. Ooh. Okay. I, I do feel coerced into taking this. And how do you f feel? I mean, let, let me explain this to you. Nobody's making you take this test. If you don't want to, you can walk right out that door. Right? And what happens to me? You walk out the door and they take you back up to your car. Okay. And if I refuse, then of course that makes me look guilty. It's not admissible in court anyway. So what do you do? It just gives us, we trust the machine, the courts just don't. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It just gives us something to verify the information that we've got so far. And obviously, as you, as you said, obviously, we, we, we got some concerns about this mattress thing. Okay, obviously some concerns are going to come up about that, and we just want to get them clarified. Because we interview people who have killed people all the time, and they don't tell us the truth. That's why we have this machine. See, you see where we're coming from? Mm -hmm. If somebody's killed somebody, they're not going to come out and tell us, yeah, I killed them. And that's what this machine is just for. But at the same time, I've got these circumstances that look bad. Mm-hmm. And and I feel like, and then I asked him, I said, after the lie detector test, <clears throat> and I pass it, can we be done with everything? And he said, yes. So mm -hmm. I feel like if I don't take this, then I'm just going to be drilled. Well, here's the other thing. If, if you got nothing to worry, if you haven't done anything, you have nothing to worry about, even if they do go through that evidence. You know what I'm saying? You have nothing to lose by this. I don't think I want to take it. Okay. And nobody's going to force you to. investigators decided to take a closer look at the apartment where they lived. They checked a gums through the building, but found nothing. Laurie's family, friends and co-workers jumped in to help Mark search for her. The next day, on July the 20th, her family held a press conference bending for any info on her whereabouts. The city was plastered with hundreds of missing person posters, featuring Laurie's picture and contact details. Soon the search for Laurie turned into a massive community effort, with over 1,200 volunteers. Laurie was well-liked and respected, and everyone was really worried about her and the safety of the community. There was a helicopter used, and there were volunteers going door-to-door -door handing out flyers and searching a Salt Lake City Park and Canyon for Laurie. More than 1,200 volunteers came out to scour the steep terrain both on foot and on horseback. While the search was ongoing, things took a very strange turn. Mark was found by police wandering around a Salt Lake City motel, wearing nothing but sandals. His brother Scott arrived to help, he found a message on a PDA stating, Take everyone, Tron Mark, this is justice. I'm so sorry. His family checked him into the psychiatric unit at the University of Utah because of a suspected mental breakdown. Meanwhile, 
investigators discovered that Mark wasn't who he said he was. He had secrets. He had told Laurie and her family that he graduated with honors in psychology from the University of Utah and got accepted into medical school at the University of North Carolina. That's why they were planning to move. But the truth was very different. Investigators found that Mark had never been accepted into medical school or even applied to the university. This shocked Mark's family because he had been traveling around the country to attend fake interviews at multiple medical schools. Mark's dad, Dr. Douglas Hacking, revealed to reporters that they were blindsided by this, thinking that the couple was happy and successful. He had books strewn around the apartment as if he was studying and writing term papers. He would tell friends, family and Laurie that he was attending classes. But what was he doing then if not going to classes and interviews? It turned out that he was spending his days hanging out at a store, smoking and drinking soda. He told the clerks that he was a therapist and asked them not to tell Laurie about his smoking. He was not supposed to smoke as they were part of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Mark told Laurie's mother he worked as a therapist at the Neuropsychiatric Institute of Utah. He ran therapy sessions, but he actually worked as a licensed healthcare assistant and hospital orderly who conducted group activities and not therapy. Mark and Laurie's family were stunned by Mark's lies, but they were still focused on finding Laurie. There was speculation that Mark made up all these lies as perceived pressure from his family as his father and brother were doctors and another was an electrical engineer. Many people involved in the search started to wonder if Mark, who lied about his education, might also be lying about what happened to Laurie. Others thought that his lies didn't necessarily mean he was involved in her disappearance. He said he initially told a small lie and that led to more lies which spiraled out of control like a wildfire, but he denied having anything to do with Laurie's disappearance. Laurie's family believed him and supported him as they continued searching for Laurie. The police, however, had a different view. Right from the start, they considered Mark a person of interest, and as evidence piled up, it all started pointing towards him as the main suspect. The last time Laurie was seen alive by anyone other than Mark seemed to be at a convenience store at around 2120 on Sunday the 18th of July in 2004. Surveillance footage shows the couple at the store and all seemed to be well between them. This was the day before she went missing. But later, Mark was seen at the same store at about 1 a.m. buying cigarettes. He told investigators that he was alone as Laurie was in bed at this time. On the day that Laurie vanished, the police searched their apartment. There were quite a few red flags that the investigators were becoming suspicious about, as this was looking more like a murder investigation and not a disappearance or kidnapping. One of the main red flags was raised when police found a receipt for a new mattress, and it later transpired that Mark, who said he was searching the park and contacting the police and Laurie's colleagues between 9.45 and 10.23 a.m., was in fact buying the new queen-size mattress at that time. The police went to the church to check the dumpsters there, as they had already checked the dumpster at the apartment. There, they found an old used mattress with the top lining cut off. Mark explained that Laurie had a heavy menstrual flow and they had to get a new mattress. He had no explanation for why he dumped it at the church and not in his own dumpster. The police also took material from two cars owned by Mark and Laurie and got surveillance videos from three places, a hospital, a church near the park where Laurie was said to have disappeared and a local convenience store. The front seat of Laurie's car found parked near the park suggested for someone much taller than her five foot four height, possibly someone around six feet tall. There was also blood found in the back seat, which was described as a transfer stain, which is when something with wet blood comes into contact with another surface. Another suspicious find was Laurie's car keys in the apartment. If she had driven to the park to jog, she likely would have had her keys with her. Police also uncovered blood stains on a side table and in one of the drawers, as well as a knife with blood stains on it. Mark, who was there while they searched the apartment, laughed nervously, saying he had the knife from the time he was in the scouts. When the police noticed another speck of blood in a fingerprint, they requested a full search warrant to do a more in-depth search. They also asked Mark to leave the apartment during the search. It now became clear that Mark was deeply involved in Laurie's disappearance, and it seemed increasingly likely that she was dead. Laurie's family, while bracing for the worst, held on to hope. They wanted to find her body and that of her unborn baby to give them a proper burial. The wait was agonizing. Less than a week after Laurie disappeared, evidence began pointing to the chilling possibility that Mark had killed her in their apartment early on July the 20th, 2004, and had then disposed of her body. This suspicion turned into a grim confirmation on July the 25th, where Mark's brother, Scott and Lance Hacking, shared a shocking confession with the police. On July the 24th, 
the brothers visited Mark in the psychiatric ward where they urged him to reveal what happened to Laurie. After giving him the afternoon to think, they returned in the evening, and that's when Mark confessed to killing Laurie. The events leading up to the murder aren't entirely clear, but some details are known. On July the 16th, Laurie found out from the University of North Carolina Medical School that Mark wasn't even enrolled there and that he had never applied. According to colleagues, Laurie was visibly upset and left work early, presumably to confront Mark at Mathis. Court documents revealed that Laurie called an employee of the University of North Carolina that day, leaving a voicemail indicating Mark had blamed a computer malfunction for his mum enrollment. Despite this obvious lie, it seemed Laurie might have believed him, as later that evening they attended a party together and everything appeared fine. On the night of July the 18th, after Laurie confronted him again, Mark admitted to lying about his education, leading to an argument. After the argument, Laurie went to bed and Mark stayed up playing computer games. After that, he went through their boxes and found his 2 2 caliber rifle. At about 1 a.m., he entered the bedroom and shot Laurie in the head. Mark confessed to his brothers that he wrapped Laurie's body in the bloodied mattress top in garbage bags and disposed of her body in a dumpster around 2 a.m. He also disposed of the mattress in a trash bin and a gun in another dumpster. The next day, Scott and Lance relayed this horrifying confession to the police. The question was why. Laurie's brother said he was sure that Laurie would have forgiven him and that he didn't need to be the president or a doctor. As long as he was doing his best, she would have loved him. Officers also found a letter addressed to Mark. In it, she says, I want to grow old with you, but can't under these conditions. I can't imagine life with you if things don't change. A forensic psychologist, Dr. Cassie Yates, commented on Mark's possible motives and seemingly pathological lying. As he grew up and was watching other family members get successful or be successful, he was not. There's an element of grandiosity. He felt like he deserved more than he was getting, but didn't want to put his energy into achieving the kind of goals that he probably could have achieved. Mark was arrested on August the 2nd, 2004, and was transferred from the psychiatric clinic to Salt Lake County Jail. He was charged with first degree murder and three counts of obstructing justice. His bail, initially set at $500,000, was later increased to $1 million. Meanwhile, the authorities started a new somber search into Salt Lake County landfill, sifting through thousands of tons of garbage in the hopes of finding Laurie's body. This daunting cask reflected the grim reality of the situation, as they now aim to recover her remains for closure and to help in the ongoing investigation. The search for Laurie at the landfill, initially expected to last a month, turned out to be a much longer and gruelling process. Volunteers have to go through thousands of tons of compacted garbage piled 30 to 40 feet deep and spending an area as large as two soccer fields. Cadaver dogs were brought in to assist. 38 volunteers, including police officers, firefighters, public safety officials, and members of the urban search and rescue team who had worked at the World Trade Center, dedicated themselves to this difficult task. They worked an average of 11 hours a day, four days a week. Dressed in protective gear like steel plated boots, coveralls, gloves, masks, and eyewear, they initially used pitchforks, but eventually had to resort to using their hands. Despite the uncertainty of finding Laurie's remains, all involved believed their efforts were worthwhile. On October the 1st, 2004, over two months since Laurie was reported missing, her body was found at the Salt Lake County landfill. Police Sergeant J.R. Nelson made the discovery, saying, I pulled this group of trash out of a bag, and here came out of the bag. He also found what seemed to be a human jawbone and teeth. The area was immediately cordoned off as a crime scene, and the investigator spent hours collecting Laurie's remains and other potential evidence for the murder trial. Despite the advanced decomposition, it was quickly confirmed that the remains were Laurie's. Laurie and Mark's families expressed a mix of grief and relief. They thanked the police and everyone who helped in the search, expressing relief that Laurie could now be laid to rest with dignity. Mark Hacking also claimed to be relieved that Laurie had been found. However, the medical examiners couldn't determine if Laurie was pregnant due to the condition of her body. Nonetheless, prosecutors believed the discovery of her body strengthened their case by proving she was murdered. On October 30, 2004, Mark appealed in court for his arraignment. To Laurie's family's dismay, his lawyers entered a not guilty plea. Selma Suarez expressed her frustration, saying Mark's plea continued to hurt them. He faced charges of first-degree murder and obstruction of justice, with a potential of life imprisonment. His trial was set for late April in 2005. 
On April the 15th, 2005, in a dramatic turn, Mark confessed in court to killing Laurie with a 2 2 rifle while she slept. As reported in the Salt Lake Tribune, Laurie's mother, Selma Suarez, was audibly distraught during his confession. The first degree murder charge was upheld in exchange for dismissing the obstruction charges. Selma Suarez, in an interview with Oprah Winfrey, expressed her hope for a harsh sentence for Mark. She believed that he would ultimately face divine justice. Mark was sentenced to five years to life. This sentence caused an outcry as it was so short, but this was the standard sentencing procedure for such cases under Utah law. After a lot of pressure, there was a review from the parole board and it was decided that he would only be eligible for a parole in 2035. Following this, the sentence for aggravated murder was increased to 15 years to life. This change in the law is known as Laurie's Law in her honor. As the legal proceedings unfolded, the hearts of Laurie's family, friends and colleagues were heavy with grief. In a moving tribute to her life, a memorial service was held on August 14, 2004 at the LDS Windsor Stake Center in Orem, Utah. The service was attended by more than 600 people and was a beautiful celebration of Laurie's life. Among those attending were members of Mark's family. His father, Dr. Douglas Hacking, opened the service with a prayer, expressing heartfelt gratitude for the indelible mark that Laurie had left on their lives. The Salt Lake Tribune captured this sentiment, highlighting the profound impact Laurie had on all who knew her. Her mother, Selma Suarez, along with other family members, shared touching tribute. Selma's words painted a picture of Laurie's vibrant life. The service wasn't just a goodbye, it was a celebration of Laurie, a testament to the love and admiration that so many held for her. In a lasting tribute to Laurie's legacy, Selma Suarez set up a scholarship fund in her daughter's name. This fund grew to a remarkable $81,000 by mid-September 2004, bolstered by a generous $50,000 donation from Oprah Winfrey, who had interviewed Mrs. Suarez. This scholarship at the University of Utah's David Eccles School of Business is more than just financial aid. It's a beacon of hope. It's dedicated to supporting women who are navigating through life's tough challenges, particularly during their crucial junior and senior years. A month before the hearing, Laurie's parents decided to remove Delaine the Hacking from her gravestone, distancing her memory from Mark. They felt that Mark had forgotten her. The gravestone now reads, Laurie K. Suarez, Vildinha, which means little daughter in Portuguese, reflecting how they will always remember her. Around the same time as Oprah's generous donation, Mark, from his prison cell, announced plans to write a book about his experiences was proceeds going to the Laurie K. Suarez Hatting Memorial Scholarship Fund. The status of this book, including how much has been written or if there's a publishing deal, remains unclear. But one thing is sure, the story of Mark Hacking is far from over. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe. And please feel free to let your voice be heard in the comments section below.